First, let's set up a couple ground rules. Michaelis Menten has two very specific experimental conditions in order to produce the information that we'll analyze. Enzyme concentration is held constant and substrate concentration is increased. Then researchers plot reaction velocity versus substrate concentration. Here's how they set up this experiment. Let's start by drawing out a few enzymes in three different cases. In the first case, we'll include the same number of substrates. In the second, we'll add some more substrate. And in the last one, we'll add a lot of substrate. Now, let's measure the rate of product formation. Understandably, as we add more substrate, the rate of product formation will increase. At a certain point, though, we have so much substrate that the enzymes are working as fast as they possibly can. To represent this graphically, we can plot the reaction velocity, or how fast we're making our product, versus the concentration of substrate. Just as we described, at a low substrate concentration, we'll see that the enzymes are able to produce lots of product. However, as we increase the substrate concentration, we eventually level out. Here's the same graph that we just produced with two very important points labeled, which are the Vmax and Km. First, Vmax is the fastest speed at which the given enzymes can work. In other words, this is the fastest that the enzymes can convert substrate to product. Second, Km is the concentration of substrate at one half Vmax. Another way you can think about Km is that it's the affinity of the enzyme for the substrate. If you remember back to general chemistry, a higher Km means a lower affinity, and a lower Km means a higher affinity. If you want your enzyme to work more quickly, would you want a lower or a higher Km? That's right, you'd want a lower Km because your enzyme can then bind to your substrate much more tightly. Now, let's dive into each of these terms in a little bit more detail. We said earlier that Vmax is the fastest speed at which the enzymes can work. Now, we can formalize that by simply multiplying the number of enzymes or a concentration of enzymes by the speed at which each enzyme works. Let's think about it this way. Let's say you have pencil makers, your enzyme, who can make five pencils every hour. If you want to figure out the Vmax, you'll simply figure out how many pencil makers you have and multiply them by five. Km is the second important term you'll need to know. Like we mentioned before, we can think of Km as the binding affinity of the substrate for an enzyme. And naturally, if the substrate can bind to the enzyme with a higher affinity, it's more likely to be captured by the enzyme and converted into a product. And like we mentioned earlier, a small Km indicates a high substrate affinity, and a large Km indicates a low substrate affinity. Now, let's conduct a thought experiment with the knowledge of these two terms. If we wanted to design the best enzyme possible, what do you think we'd want to do? Well, first, we want it to work very quickly. Hence, the speed, which is denoted by k cat, should be high. Then we would also want the enzyme to bind substrate even if very little substrate was available. As such, Km should be low because that means we have a high substrate affinity. Now, we can easily see that our prediction holds true if we look at the catalytic efficiency formula. The speed of a single enzyme is directly proportional to catalytic efficiency, while the affinity is inversely proportional. We've already learned how to draw our michaelis menten graphs. But now we need to translate these to a lineweaver burke plot. This conversion is relatively simple and only a few changes need to be made. In essence, all we do is take the reciprocal of each term in the michaelis menten graph. Now, what does that mean? If we look at the x-axis, you can see that all we did was take the concentration of substrate and replace it with 1 over the concentration of substrate. We did the same on the y-axis as well. And finally, the reason we use lineweaver burke graphs is because they make visualizing our Vmax and Km very straightforward. Here, you can see that 1 over Vmax is the y-intercept, while negative 1 over Km is the x-intercept. When it comes to enzyme inhibition, these are the three questions you'll need to answer. For our third tutor tip of the day, I'll challenge you to try and apply this method of identifying the key points of what you need to know when you study other MCAT subjects. Your tutors will point these out for you, but it'll work best if you also attempt to synthesize the information and make these connections in a way that makes most sense to you in the way you think. So I'll read through these questions as you follow along. One, what happens to the Vmax? Two, what happens to the Km? And three, what does the Lineweaver-Burke plot look like? Let's first look at competitive inhibition. 
Here, the inhibitor binds to the enzyme's active site, which prevents the substrate from binding. Let's use our reaction scheme to draw out what happens and to answer our three questions. First, what's our competitive inhibitor going to bind to? Like we've said, the competitive inhibitor will bind to the enzyme's active site. So I'll draw an arrow to form an enzyme inhibitor complex. Now, let's think back to Le Chatelier's principle from chemistry. If the enzyme is binding the inhibitor, it's going to look like the concentration of free enzyme is going down because it's being bound up by the inhibitor. As such, the first reaction will move to the left in order to replace that missing enzyme, and the amount of substrate will actually increase. We'll come back to this point and what it means in a moment. Now, let's look at another interesting property of the reaction scheme. Since the inhibitor is not binding to the enzyme substrate complex, if we can form the enzyme substrate complex, we'll still be able to carry out the forward reaction. As such, Vmax will be unchanged. Let's think about this in a different way. Remember the initial graph we drew for our experiment? I'll draw it here again. We plotted the reaction velocity versus the concentration of substrate. As we increase substrate concentration, we approached Vmax. Now, if we add in a competitive inhibitor, the amount of free enzyme decreases because the inhibitor is binding our active site. If, however, we increase substrate to a super high level, we can overcome that inhibition and once again reach Vmax. Think about it this way. If we had one inhibitor molecule and one million substrates, the inhibitor would have virtually no effect. As such, we can conclude that our Vmax stays the same in competitive inhibition. Now, what happened to Km? Remember, Km was our concentration of substrate. Using Le Chatelier's principle, we can see that Km increased. And finally, what's our Lineweaver-Burke plot going to look like? Let's walk through this plot. First, we can see that the y-intercept, or Vmax, stayed the same, which makes sense given our prediction. However, something happened with our Km value. Let's say our Km increased from 5 to 10. Now, negative 1 over Km would change from negative 1 over 5 to negative 1 over 10. As you can see, we move closer to 0, which is why the curve shifts the way it does. It'll be important to remember the way this curve looks, as the MCAT loves to ask questions about it. Let's move on to uncompetitive inhibition. Be careful as you study not to confuse uncompetitive inhibition with non-competitive inhibition. Just like we did with competitive inhibition, we'll draw out our reaction scheme, except here, the inhibitor binds only to the enzyme substrate complex. Vmax is actually going to decrease here because the amount of enzyme substrate complex we form determines the amount of product we get. How does this make sense? Let's think of a really tall water slide. 99% of the battle is gaining the courage to make it to the top of the water slide, and we can think of this as E plus S. Once you make it to the top, the rest is downhill and easy. Now, let's consider ES as you when you're halfway down the water slide. <laughs> More likely than not, you're going to continue down to the bottom of the water slide, or to the enzyme plus product, if you make it halfway down the slide. In competitive inhibition, we didn't change ES. In uncompetitive inhibition, we are changing ES. In other words, we're completely taking away some of the water slides. So no matter what we do or how often we get back to the top of the water slide, we'll never get to the bottom as many times. So we can conclude that Vmax decreases. We've established that Vmax decreases. Using the same logic that we use with competitive inhibition, let's determine what happens to Km. Since the inhibitor binds to the enzyme substrate complex, it looks like we have less enzyme substrate complex. Therefore, our first reaction will be pushed to the right and the amount of substrate will decrease. Therefore, Km will decrease. And finally, what does our Lineweaver-Burke plot look like? Here, we can see that Vmax decreased. So one over Vmax increases the y-intercept of the line. Let's now look at Km and pretend our Km decreased from 10 to five. On the Lineweaver-Burke plot, we can go from minus 1 over 10 to minus 1 over 5, which means we're moving further away from 0 and therefore to the left. Finally, let's look at mixed and non-competitive inhibition. Many students are confused by this final form of inhibition in which the inhibitor binds to an allosteric site on both the enzyme and the enzyme substrate complex. It's important to note that mixed inhibition is a broader category 
and non-competitive inhibition is a specific type of mixed inhibition. If we take our normal reaction scheme, we can now draw our inhibitor binding to either the enzyme alone or the enzyme substrate complex. Based on the many factors, one inhibitor might bind the enzyme alone 70% of the time while binding the enzyme substrate complex 30% of the time. Another inhibitor might do the exact opposite. Non-competitive inhibition is a very special case in which the inhibitor binds the enzyme and the enzyme substrate complex equally. The MCAT likely won't expect you to know the intricacies of mixed inhibition as it can get very complicated very fast. But non-competitive inhibition is most definitely fair game. As we draw out our normal reaction scheme, we can see that the inhibitor binds to the enzyme substrate complex and in essence takes away some of those water slides if we think back to our water slide analogy. As such, Vmax must decrease. Now, KM does something interesting here. Since the inhibitor is binding equally to the enzyme alone and to the enzyme substrate complex, KM will actually stay the same. Finally, let's look at our line weaver burke plot. Just as we analyzed each of the previous graphs, we can see how our two parameters translate to the curves. Here, our KM is the same, so the x-intercept is unchanged. Vmax decreases though, so 1 over Vmax does what? Increases. We've covered a lot of important material so far, and this table nicely summarizes what happens in our major forms of enzyme inhibition. While you can memorize this table, it's important to know how we got to each of these values. In addition, the way we got to each of these values demonstrates that you understand other important enzyme-related topics.